What's up, movie friends? Welcome back to the show. This is Anthony. And this is James, and we're stumbling back into Chris Nolan's world. We're going to be doing The Prestige, which is one of our favorite Nolan films, which seems to get hidden inside his incredible filmography, but it's a gem. We were itching to do another Nolan movie. Oh, yeah. Every time we do Nolan, I get so giddy and excited. <laughs> we're, we're the we, biggest fanboys. Yeah, we've, we've discussed Dark Knight, Inception, and Dunkirk, all of them, and Tenet. Prestige a little bit before, but we were like, let's dedicate a whole episode to The Prestige. It deserves, it deserves one. Deserves it. It's a long film. Film, but there's so much to go over and it's very dense and like you said he has such an incredible filmography that it gets lost in the shuffle i think but I, I, everyone we talk to loves this movie we get comments all the time from all the time from fans saying how much they love this movie and asking us to do an episode on it and everything we've posted in terms of social media content regarding the prestige always performs well so i think that even though this movie didn't make much money it did make a profit it was successful it's like 100 million on a 40 million dollar budget i believe i I think in total yeah Yeah. so not a huge huge success but for what it was a period piece about magicians like it did really well and also had it was up against another magician movie that same year the illusionist came out with edward norton and paul giamatti and jessica biel and that movie they were coming out around the same time during Oscar season, and people were like, it's the Battle of the Magician movies, but The Prestige ended up being the far superior movie. Yeah, its its audience loves this film. Critically, it got 76% on Rotten Tomatoes, but it has a 92% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes. That's surprising, the critic score. Yeah, well, critics are haters for yeah. Chris Nolan, yeah. and they hate him. And then IMDb, it's 8.5, and it's a top-rated movie of all time, number 47 on IMDb's user wow, list. Wow, 47? insane when you think about it, but because he, uh, Nolan also has The Dark Knight up there, I'm sure Batman Begins is up there as well, maybe Inception. Inception, yeah. in, in, Inception and Dark Knight are in the top 25. Interstellar's up in the top 100, too. How many movies does he have at over 8-point rating on IMDb? Uh, probably maybe half all of them. them. Maybe most of them. Maybe, maybe half of them. Because Dark Knight Rises is eight point two, and then is I wonder. It really? Yeah, eight point two. I wonder how many he has in the top fifty of IMDb. But either way, it's a very underappreciated film, and it got nominated for cinematography and art direction. But still, it's it's one of those movies where how doesn't this get acclaim for best picture nominations? Even the acting is terrific. I mean, Hugh Jackman gives an incredible performance in this movie. I think it's his best performance so f- in his career. It I could think, be. I really think so. Yeah. It's a very complex role, and he does a fantastic job because at this point, he was doing the X-Men. He was doing Wolverine, and uh, I wasn't. we weren't really seeing him in anything else in terms of big major mo- motion pictures. Well, he was in the um, the Aronofsky film. Oh, the, 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 fountain, the Fountain. The Fountain. But um, I believe that's, yeah, that came out in 2005, so you're right. But But other than that, like, that movie, no one saw it. I so saw he, it. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that movie. It's great. It's awesome. And I think that people saw a new, saw how talented he is because he's a very very talented actor. But because he did Logan like ten times, it's like you kind of like get he doesn't get that many juicy roles to play because he has so, he had dedicated like fifteen years of his life to playing Logan, and th- that takes up a big chunk of his schedule. So he only has so many opportunities to do other films, which he as he grew older he was able to do like more films outside of the X-Men universe, but this is one of those where you got to see how talented the guy is. Yeah, not to mention just from being a film actor, but a theatrical actor. He's a great singer and dancer and just overall performer. He's a very confident artist. And Triple just, threat. So like to see him bring his stage chops to a character that really needs it with Robert Angier, which we'll get into later on, it, it's just so great to see someone who really embodies that character already in their real life, being a natural stage performer. And what Chris Nolan brought began bringing to his movies with Batman Begins and with this movie is the casting. If you watch Chris Nolan movies, they're always cast with incredible actors. Insomnia, and, too. Yeah, Insomnia as well, but there's only two real leads, but Hilary Swank is in that, too. So yeah, definitely Insomnia. So he really cares so much about casting, and the thing with him is he. I've read interviews where he says that if I cast an A-class act, like an A-caliber actor, like a best of the best I don't have my my job's done. All I have to do is shoot them, and they're doing their job because they're the best there is. They're the best at their game. So if I can get the best actors possible, it, most of my job is done. And yeah. he does that. His, his movies are always so well cast. That would, that's what he changed with superhero genre, where he made a, the first Batman Begins movie, but it has an incredible cast. You got Oscar nominees. You got Gary Oldman. You got Michael Caine. You got these incredible established actors. Liam playing. Neeson. Yeah, Liam Neeson. Like this is a superhero movie, but he's casting some of the best actors alive. Marvel is taking notes for Iron Man. All right, we, exactly. need, we need some stars in this movie. Exactly. We'll, we'll bring in uh, Robert Downey Jr. <laughs> and then Jeff Bridges. Is yeah, gonna be Jeff great. Bridges. Yeah, exactly. Paltrow. Where before that, it was superhero movies were like, who's the hottest star around? Mm-hmm. And otherwise, the other than the leads, the supporting actors weren't anyone to take note of but then nolan changed the game in terms of how you cast superhero movies and now all of his films 
especially the prestige are so impeccably cast and that makes all the difference yeah i can hear how excited anthony is to talk about this film but let's let's slow down for a second and before we continue the best way to support readers of the lost podcast is to share us with your family and friends and become a patron at patreon.com slash readers of lost podcast patrons get perks like personalized videos or you get to see our podcast schedules for upcoming episodes top tier patrons get a monthly shout out on the podcast which we just did a few episodes ago and the best perk of all is every single patron no matter what tier of uh, income you're you're contributing to the show. Every patron has access to weekly bonus episodes on every Tuesday that only patrons can listen to and watch. Head on over to our website, RaidersOfTheLostPodcast.com to check out all of our sources of content, our merch, our custom movie posters. Follow, subscribe wherever you're listening. Hit the notification bells. If you're watching on YouTube, subscribe. Leave a comment. Hit the like button. And thank you so much for tuning in around the world, everybody. All right, you can go back. And what another thing that Nolan brings to his films that he brought to Batman Begins and Insomnia is atmosphere. And atmosphere is so important. It's something that like David Fincher is really good at portraying where it's when he's establishing the world and establishing the story. And it's not like what Nolan likes to do is he likes to shoot these really grand scale exterior shots. And it's oftentimes like helicopter shots showing these incredible environments and landscapes of the locations we're looking at where most filmmakers don't really tend to do that too much, but he likes to expand the scope of the world where you're not just in the scenes in these sets, but he's showing you where they are in the world. Like there's these amazing shots of like the train in Colorado and in England and stuff. So there's great establishing atmospheric shots that he uses to set the tone and the style visual style of the movie that he he brought to like batman begins when in the first act when he's doing these amazing helicopter shots of the glacier you know things like mm -hmm. that which really bring about the scope and make you feel like you're watching something grand did the same thing with insomnia it exactly. looks almost like the same glacier probably could be yeah and the prestige in my opinion is the rare example where the movie is better than the book. I've read the book, it's also very good, but it's very different too. And the way that the book plays out is it's really two halves. The first half is Alfred Borden and his diary and his POV of the story. And then the second half of the book is all Robert Angier and his diary and his POV of the story. And it kind of wraps everything up together towards the end. But what Nolan did is very similar to what he did with Batman Begins, where he tells the story out of order on purpose. And just like Memento, the opening scene is the final scene of the film, really. So not the hats, but the magic trick that Michael Caine shows the young girl. That's the end of the movie. Yeah, and it can be a confusing movie on your first watch, but as you watch it on repeat viewings, you really get a grasp for what he's doing, how he's jumping around from time. And it is it can be confusing because of how often he does it. It's not like um, Pulp Fiction or even Batman Begins, where he does take a little time between the periods. In this movie, there are 146 cuts to different time periods, whether it's jumping backwards or forwards or even further backwards. And so, and there are three main different timelines going on in the film. And it, it's a little hard as an audience member, your first time taking it in, understanding the storyline and the plot going on at first, because it is, there's a lot to take in. You're getting different narrators between Angier and Borden at different times in their lives. And then they're, they're even talking to each other through the diary. So it can be a lot at first, but on repeat viewings, and when you get a grasp for what is going on, it really makes you appreciate the story and the writing as yeah, well. It seems to be something that he sort of picked up from Pulp, from Pulp Fiction, obviously, in Tarantino style, but also Terrence Malick, where Terrence Malick does the same thing, where he can transport you years in the, in the future, years in the past, to a memory with just a cut, but no one does it to an extreme in this film especially. Yeah, and it ends up being a strength of the film because the mystery of what's going on is one of the strongest elements of the movie. Trying to understand... Both these magicians, they have these secrets that they're hiding from one another and from the audience. And we both know, as an audience member, the first time watching it, you don't know what they are, but you're so intrigued by them. And you want to figure out what are they hiding? What What is behind the curtain for both of them? And when, as this movie is famous for having a really great twist. And multiple really, twists. Yeah, multiple twists and a great ending, which really ha is paid off because it's established so well. And when the journey to getting to that twist and to that finale is so fantastic. Yeah, and we'll journey through this episode getting to the finals. We, because I think this film is such a great third act and twist reveal, we don't want to spoil it right away. We want to save it a little bit. And for, but, Yeah, not everyone has seen it. So yeah, if in case, or maybe if not everyone's seen it, they maybe don't fully understand it yet. And I think we yeah. just want to lay out the entire film to explain the ending a lot better. Mm -hmm. And the great thing about this with the story of these two feuding magicians in what 1890s England, London, is Nolan's directing... 
his entire style of this film and directing, it, it's like he's performing a magic trick as well, like the magicians as well. He misdirects you. He shows you one thing instead of showing another. But he doesn't do it like a lot of lazy filmmakers do if they're trying to purposely hide information from you, which they could tell you earlier or give you hints at. But he sort of hides everything in plain sight. And like we've talked about with a lot of Nolan's films, except for obviously the Batman films, he generally tells you the rules of his movie in the first couple minutes, in the first few scenes, which he does in this movie. The opening shot of this movie is the hats which is the prestige of the trick that Andrew eventually develops with Tesla, the magic trick, which is really a scientific experiment. But it's a great shot because it's, it's the hats, but also the title, the prestige, is literally an example of what that shot is. But without the context, it's just an image to us that we don't know. It has no meaning to exactly. us. So he's showing us what, it, what the finale is, but he, without the context and understanding what the image means or represents, we're at a loss. But then, because we've seen the image, when when we see it again later in the film, we rec we connect to it and we understand, oh, that's what the hats meant. Exactly. But also following the hat shot, he goes into the cut scene of Cutter, who is the stagehand, basically, and the creator of the, the apparatus yeah, for I the Yeah, I can't tricks. remember. The term is hard to pronounce, the yeah, word. It's um, a French word. He is doing the magic trick for the young girl who we don't know yet, who is Jess. And he performs the trick of the disappearing bird. And this trick, Nolan shows you, is a perfect metaphor for Angier and his trick later on. So he tells you the rules of the entire story. He's basically revealing the trick to us with the bird metaphor of what Michael Caine's doing. And the bird's also a metaphor of Alfred as well. Yes. Which we'll get to when we finish with a spoiler-free part. But I love the opening dialogue of Michael Caine's character, Cutter, of this film. And I'd just like to recite it for a moment, if that's cool with you. Can you do a Michael Caine voice while uh, you do it? I, I think that would just take away from it because I'm I, Michael Caine. would be a terrible impression. Every magic trick consists of three parts or acts. The first part is called the pledge. The magician shows you something ordinary, a deck of cards, a bird, or a man. He shows you this object. Perhaps he asks you to inspect it to see if it is indeed real, indeed real, unaltered, normal. But of course, it probably isn't. The second act is called the turn. The magician takes the ordinary something and makes it do something extraordinary. Now you're looking for the secret, but you won't find it because of course you're not really looking. You don't really want to know. You want to be fooled, but you won't clap yet because making something disappear isn't enough. You have to bring it back. That's why every magic trick has a third act. The hardest part, the part we call the prestige. And essentially, you could say that is comparable to writing a screenplay, writing a story. You have three acts. You establish the story. Then you have the meat and the potatoes in the middle, which in which you have the conflict and the driving action. And then you bring it all together with the finale and the third act and the climax. So a magic trick very much it falls in line with how you would write a story traditionally. And magicians, they're such a fascinating profession throughout the last two centuries of human existence and culture. You know, they were kind of rock stars at this time. They were really popular, the biggest theatrical act that you could go see, really. And it's so interesting to combine that with film because early filmmakers were illusionists and magicians in a way. They would, you would go see these little mini short films. You know, the Lumiere brothers were very famous for this too, where they would show these films, but they were like illusions. Like someone would be disappearing into frame or coming out of frame and there'd be impossible things that you never seen before but it's really just simple film tricks so it's so cool to watch this story play out on film i think that's why nolan really gravitated to the story as a way of showcasing how similar film and magic is because film essentially is illusion you're the the, the crafting of a story on on film and now on digital as well is the art of illusion and the audience is, is taking in the illusion of the story before them it's the same thing mm -hmm. and i would say the main theme of this film is obsession but also secrets secrets and also cost and like the the what they say multiple times throughout the film tesla says it sacrifice says it, sacrifice but also the cost of a good trick or the price of a good trick you know have you considered the cost of the of the of what you want whereas uh, Angier doesn't understand what Tesla means, but Tesla's like, have you understood the cost? He's trying to just let him know that, like, what this could do to you, your humanity. M misguided ambition. Yeah, they're both they both have they're both very ambitious men, and they both go to extremes to achieve their goals and accomplish what they set out to do. Whereas Alfred, we won't get to it yet, but he doesn't do anything nefarious or you could say evil. 
whereas Angier becomes a much darker person by achieving his goals. Well, they do both do nefarious things. Yeah. So not in terms of what Angier does to that level, but they do get into this feud of sabotaging each other's magic acts mm -hmm. after the death of Angier's wife that Borden may have caused that they don't know fully if he caused, but probably did cause. But she also agreed to the type of knot that he wanted to tie. Yeah, exactly. But it was they weren't supposed to do that knot. Yeah. And, and for some reason, Alfred doesn't really fully know Half of him thinks he did one knot, half of him thinks he did the other knot. How could he not know? How could you not know? It's like his mind is divided. He's a he's a troubled person, which we'll get into more. But let's get into the characters first before we get into the plot of the film. And the first one I think we should talk about is Robert Angier, played by Hugh Jackman. And so Robert Angier is a great performer, but a very mediocre magician. And the thing that I think Nolan did very, that was really interesting with this character is we he gave him an American accent. Whereas in the book, I'm pretty sure he's also English because Angier, they only hint at this with really two lines in the film. He comes from nobility. In the book, I believe his brother became a duke of a region of, of the UK and that he eventually was that. So so really, Angier is a fake personality for Lord Caldwell. Lord Caldwell is who Robert Angier really is. That's why early on his wife says, like, this is why you like you hide you, your you, theatrical. You have a different name. Yeah, you hide from your family because you, you don't want them to, or he says he doesn't want them to see his theatrical performances. Oh, okay. So he's really hiding from his family. They don't they don't get into it. So he movie. really is a lord. So he really eventually becomes a lord. That's who he really is. But Robert Angier is his fake personality, so that he doesn't look like he comes Tarnished from privilege, the family name. but he does yeah. come from extreme privilege and wealth. That's why he always seems to have a lot of resources compared to. And he dresses really well. Yeah, you can exactly. tell the difference between the way he dresses and Borden dresses. They have completely different incomes. But I think it was really clever for Nolan to give this character an American accent because it makes American audiences relate to it more. It probably increased the potential profits of the film as well. Also, the American accent is probably a fake accent. It's a fake accent for it him. It could be. So he's, he's always performing in front of everyone as Robert Angier. Could be, but I don't think we know that for sure for him. I think Borden's more of the lifetime for, uh, illusionist. Yeah, but be, you, yeah, that's a point. But also, if he really is Lord Carlo, how, how, what's the, how do you say it exactly? Codlow. Codlow. Then he probably naturally has a British Well, no, accent. that's in the book. So I think he okay. just creates the persona of Lord Codlow in the movie. So oh, that's so just like... A, one, it's a reference. Yeah, I think that's just one mini, mini thing that really the book really does differently. Gotcha. That I'll talk about for the movie. I don't want to ruin the book for anything. But mm -hmm. so that's the, that's the real difference between Angier and Borden is, is Angier, again, mediocre magician, but terrific performer. Whereas Alfred is a terrific magician and a mediocre performer. Terrible where, performer. Where he can't say. sell his tricks. He, he seems to, when he's on stage performing, he doesn't seem to have the passion he has for magic that he has on his own. When he's in private working in his workshop, he seems to be much more happy on his alone in the workshop, making tricks, building the sets and stuff. Where when he's performing in front of a crowd, he doesn't seem to be enjoying it. That's such a great point because especially when he's with Sarah and he's with his nephew, her nephew, and he, she does he does the little magic tricks for them. He's so excited and elated by what he's doing. Yeah, but like when he's in that bar in downtown and he does a bullet trick, like before that, he's doing the rings and he has like this really st stern face and. He's not enjoying the experience of doing the magic, even though he's clearly not happy to be doing magic in like a backroom bar, but you have to start somewhere. And clearly, if you perform like that with the lack of a personality, you're never going to get ahead. And the same thing happens to him even when he reveals his great trick, the transported man for the first time where no one claps because the trick was performed so poorly, even though it's one of the greatest tricks anyone's ever seen. It's like, well, what it was, just happened? I can't even react to that. It was hard that. to even accept or even understand what was going on yeah. because he just did not... Uh, uh, and he didn't sh bring it, uh, talk it up. Yeah, and these two were colleagues who worked as basically assistants for another stage magician. But as we learn from Borden, like that magician, he's he's gotten too comfortable. He's too successful. He's not taking any risks. And it shows that they both have tremendous ambition for young magicians of their age. And I really like the scene when um when Michael Caine's character Cutter, Cutter sends them to see that magician, that Chinese magician, Chung Si Chung Li Chung Li Su. And they, sh to do the to watch his magic uh, fish fish bowl goldfish trick, bowl. goldfish trick, and it seems to be an impossible trick for anyone to handle. And this is where you can see the difference between Alfred and Angier in terms of Alfred really understanding magic and and the creation of a ma magic trick much better than Angier, where he's he's immediately spots when Chung Lu si, Chung Si Lu. Ex exits the theater and goes to his carriage. He's he's walking very gingerly. He seems to be very elderly, but Alfred immediately points out that this is the act right here. He lives the act. He understands that in order to sell this magic trick, 
it only works if the public thinks that he can barely even lift that that fishbowl. He has to live his entire life as the act. And I think Alfred understands this because he himself has been living an act for his entire life as well, which we'll get to soon. Exactly. And and then they both have love interests as well. And the first one that we are introduced to is uh, Julia, who's played by Pepper Parabo, and she is um, Angier's wife, and she is the stage assistant for the magician that they all work for she has the horrific death of drowning uh, drowning in that tank after borden ties that knot that isn't a wet knot that cutter tells him not to do but him he and julia insist that it will work and they can do it and they think it's a better knot because if they want a stronger knot to hold her up because the other knot is almost slipping every time she goes up in the hook yeah but cutter doesn't he's trying to let them know that it's not a wet knot meaning the rope's going to swell more and she'll not be able to slip it in the tank and which this, is what happens this is a really great scene and cutter trying to break through the tank with an axe is it's really tragic and intense and and when she spills out onto the floor it, and hugh jackman does a great job performing the scene he's fantastic in it. and this is the event that sets these two friends and colleagues well not exactly friends but colleagues on these paths of sabotaging each other's lives forever especially angier who always for the rest of his life wants to constantly get revenge against alfred but he never even satisfies that quench whereas alfred is more just reacting to the acts of angier yeah and also it gets to the point where angier becomes so obsessed with the transported man that alfred has invented that he refuses to accept anything any kind of explanation that cutter gives any kind of explanation that um, what's her what's Sarah, Scarjo's character Olivia Olivia gives, even though she ends up working for for Borden and sees behind the scenes, he refuses to accept anything other than the impossible, and he becomes obsessed with Borden's magic. Exactly. And then there's Sarah, who is played by Rebecca Hall, and she is Alfred Borden's eventual wife in the film, and she's a great character because she brings n normalcy to Borden's life, but also we sh we see this. Throughout the film of duality, yeah, this throughout this relationship and marriage, it starts to crumble and break down emotionally for Sarah, especially because she can't deal with the secrets. Because again, Alfred is someone we learn is living his act every day of his life, and it, it's not fair what he does to Sarah. It's not fair what he does to Olivia. It's same thing with Aunt, with Angier. It's not fair what he does to Olivia either. But these magicians, they risk everything with their ambitions, and they end up causing either all of the women in their lives to be pushed away from them or they push them, them away from them themselves or they die and also in terms of alfred's personality he seems to be one person one day and another person the other day where she says like i can tell when you really love me and i can tell when you don't love me and you love magic more than me and i think over the years it becomes a breaking point where she can't stand this duality to alfred's personality where it becomes impossible to maintain a marriage with someone who is complete who's one minute loves me and the next minute doesn't even want to be around me yeah and it, you can tell in the early parts of their relationship where the first time she brings it up she actually brings it up as a pause where like it, it actually makes the days where you say and you mean it a lot more meaningful to me whereas towards the end of the relationship when she's coping with alcoholism and and on the verge of suicide she says that she can't take it anymore and the, the, the days the that the days that you don't love me make it even worse yeah so it's what happens to her is she just mentally gets broken down by borden's secrets and lies mm -hmm. it's it's a tragic story for her and then michael kane gives a terrific performance as cutter i think it's one of his best performances of of the 2000s for sure he's fantastic he has a huge role in this yeah. he, has, he has a lot to do in this movie and i love how much christopher nolan uses him in his movies because michael kane is one of the best actors of all time hands down he's sensational and in this movie he really carries a lot of the movie on his own and what's so fascinating about what we we're talking about early on in the first act where we're learning about these two young magicians is before all this the first act of the film, after the magi after the hats, after the magic trick with the young girl, we're watching the prosecution of Alfred Borden for the murder of Robert Angier. And this is such a fascinating way to set up this story because Angier is supposed to be dead. And we watched it happen, and yeah. Alfred clearly didn't do it. Yeah, Alfred's innocent for yeah. sure. He didn't kill Angier. He just watched him drown and tried to save him, which we eventually find out too. But it's so it's so it's such an interesting way to tell the story broken up like this, which I think it's when you do it effectively like Nolan does, like Chris, like 
what, what Tarantino can do. It just adds so much more to the story. And like you said earlier when we were talking about Kill Bill a few episodes back, if you did it perfectly chronological order, it wouldn't be that exciting of a plot. I think that's why Nolan did that because as I told you with the book, it's really just here's the first half with all Alfred Borden, the second half is all Robert Angier. But when you mix it all together brilliantly like Nolan does and go back and forth between time, it's a really intriguing story. Yeah, because if that, it was if it was done chronologically, Angier wouldn't go to Colorado Springs until like an hour and a half into the movie. For sure. So the story is not even close to as compelling. And it's because of the mystery that he establishes with that kind of storytelling, which is the strength of the movie, the, the mystery of the story itself, like trying to figure out what they're trying to figure out, you know? Yeah, and then we get on the story in the paths of how they both are developing their new tricks throughout their lives. And so Borden comes with, up with this brilliant trick that he's he says is, it's almost ready, it's not ready yet, but when the world sees it, it'll be what I'll be remembered for. And it's the transported man. And then once Angier goes to see the transported man, he comes back to talk to Olivia about it. He says it's the greatest magic trick he's ever seen in his life. But like you said earlier, when he's talking to Cutter about it, Cutter's telling him straight up how he does it. And what Cutter tells him is completely right. The only way he can do it, the only the only way I know how to do it is with a double. But like you said, Angier's so arrogant and so prideful, he thinks it's something more profound than that. He thinks it's something inexplicable. And he wants it. He Cutter says you want it to be something that is impossible, but it's not. And But Angier can't get over the fact that he ha he has duplicated the transported man, but he can't stand the fact that he has to take this the the applause. He has to hear the roar of the crowd from beneath the stage, and it's killing him, and it's eating away at him because he seems to be at this point all about the glory. He wants the glory. He wants the crowd to be applauding him, and he wants to be able to see it happen, which is why he does not like how with this setup with the with the stage actor they they have hired and altered to uh, have an identical appearance to him. He does not like the setup of having to finish this the act on, under the stage. Yeah, one of my favorite parts about the script of Jonathan and Christopher Nolan's great writing is there are so many little lines of dialogue that foreshadow events to come. So what we're talking about is how after Angier goes and sees the transported man, now he decides, I'm just going to copy his trick. There's no point in being coy anymore. We're going to call it the new transported man. We're going to try to do it better because we're better performers. And since he's probably using a double... We'll just use a double as well. And this is actually foreshadowed early on where Angier says to Borden and Cutter while they're all just talking after one of the performances of the other magician, he says, any trick can be duplicated. So there's a ton of little lines like that that give you foreshadow to what's about to happen in the film. Oh, yeah, you're right. That's great. There are a ton of little Easter eggs in this. Oh, yeah, tons of them. If you're looking for them. Are you watching closely? Are you watching closely? And so Cutter takes it upon himself because this is the only way Cutter knows how to do it. He's using a double, so we have to go out there and find somebody who looks like Angier close enough to even just make him, spiffy him up to make him look as much like Angier as we can. And it's it's great physical performance from Hugh Jackman as he plays Gerald Root, who is a, an, a not-working stage actor. That's why he's so crazy, which Olivia jokes about. Of course he's insane. He's, a, he's, a, he's <laughs> out an out-of-work actor. Out of work actor. But the physical performance of like the overbite of his character and like the big teeth and he's like got, the, yeah, different he's teeth. got like a different jawline that he's like sucking in. It's a, it's a really great physical performance by him. And you can tell obviously it's Hugh Jackman, but I think they did a great job of establishing like this is you mean it's just someone who looks a lot like him. And then when Cutter's through with him, probably doing some kind of medical surgery on his face and then obviously dyeing his hair and and training him, uh, he could pass as Angier from a distance in the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> and like we said, how Angier is a much better performer, even though they have the exact same trick, he dresses it up so much better. And plus he has Olivia to help establish the trick. And his trick becomes more successful than Borden's, even though it's the same trick. Yeah. Like it, it's just as performed better, throwing the hat, having the doors where you can see them from uh, the perspective of the side angle so you can clearly see there's nothing behind them at all. And so I think the way that he performs it is better, which is... But then also his hubris and his arrogance, like you said, he's a very arrogant person. It's what sends, it's what makes him send Olivia to Borden to steal his secret. And this hubris is the downfall of his trick and the cause of him breaking his leg because Olivia felt betrayed by him and therefore betrayed Al uh, Angier and, and became loyal to Alfred. True, and that's how Borden sabotaged that trick for him to hurt his, break his leg. But before that, what happens is they both sabotage each other's early acts. And so mm -hmm. this is before Angier gets to that stage and he steals the transported man where 
Um, Alfred Borden, that trick's not ready yet to be performed. The transported man is not ready, so he's trying to do the bullet catch. He's trying to basically get his name known to London and be a great magician, just word of mouth. He's, the professor. He's doing uh, a bullet catch, which is such a daring thing, and he even shows Sarah that it's a safe thing, and, like, the, the only thing that could happen, like, God forbid someone put a bullet in there, Sarah, but, like, <laughs> other than that, it's a safe trick, according to him, but he doesn't factor in the possibility that while he's performing the bullet trick and he asks for a volunteer to check that it's a real gun and, and to actually pull the trigger at him that Angier would show up because he was still in his depressive uh, being after the death of Julia puts a real bullet in there and shoots Borden but thank god his stage hand what's his name um, is there Fallon. To, Fallon is there to uh, push the gun almost out of the way but it shoots Borden's hand so now Borden has to deal with the reality that he's missing two fingers on one of his hands and he's a magician so there's only so much he can do now and Borden retaliates by sabotaging the cage bird trick that Angier has established in his new performance and he that lady gets her hands oh and God. fingers broken and stabbed by that oh man because those things the cages are supposed to yeah. pull in her fingers yeah. are stuck so oh. both of their first new acts are sabotaged by each other and so this is a recurring theme in all of their futures together is they're going to be constantly going at, at each other's throats for revenge yeah and then the trans Porter Man is invented. But then after Olivia betrays um, Angier and becomes loyal to Borden, this is what drives uh, Angier to capture Fallon and bury him alive. But before that, I think it's important to talk about how because Olivia is falling in love with Alfred, who she calls Freddy, actually, she tells him how to find Gerald Root. And Borden gets to Gerald Root. And yes, he's, and yeah, he's yeah. talking about, oh, I used to be a magician too. Oh, you're the great Danton, aren't you? Shh, oh, yes, 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 of course yes, I am. Course but, I am. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> he's so good as a drunk. And he's telling him that I used to have an act too, and I used a double. But what I didn't realize is the double eventually learned that he has complete power over me. Complete, complete power, power, you say. <laughs> <laughs> and so this leads to. What he would obviously know as Gerald Root throwing a wrench into the entire act and starting to get more power over the situation. And then it allowed Borden to sneak into the act himself, sabotage it, come out from the other side of the trap door from below the stage, and just a perfect advertising for his show at the Pantages across the street. There's just too much magic on this stage. <laughs> It'd be easy on him. He does try so very hard. <laughs> I love that scene. It's great. It's really good. Tons of extras. Yeah. But then this is what leads us to Nikolai Tesla. And it's so fat. I love when real life characters are put into fictional stories. I think it's so much fun and such an interesting way of writing. And having Nikolai Tesla in this story adds so much to the, to, to the film itself. I think it's fantastic having him in it. Plus David Bowie yeah, is David playing Bowie. Nikola Tesla. And Nolan apparently only wanted Bowie and couldn't didn't want to cast anyone else. And Bowie turned it down. And so Chris Nolan flew out to him directly to have a, a personal one-on-one -on -one chat about the movie, and he eventually convinced David Bowie to accept the role because it has. To, Nikolai Tesla was such a larger-than-life personality. You need someone like that to, mm. to cause so when you see David Bowie in the role, and David Bowie being this icon, this larger-than-life personality, it fits Nikolai Tesla. Yeah, exactly. And so the way he learns about Nikola Tesla is when he buries Fallon alive after him and Cutter kidnap. Fallon, which is pretty crazy. And yeah, like that's pretty. I'm pr I'm surprised Cutter went along with that. But Cutter is also somebody who gets his hands dirty, and yeah, so yeah. that's the same thing where he's showing him that bird trick where Andrew get off the bloody stage. Andrew's <laughs> Andrew's always been afraid to get his hands dirty. He doesn't have to with the bird trick, but Cutter just wanted to know that he could if he had to. Mm -hmm. So it was a test, really. It's like the Green Knight, and um, <laughs> <laughs> so he gets his hand dirty by hands dirty by burying Fallon alive with Cutter, and he gets the keyword to. Alfred Borden's diary and the keyword is he wants the trick and Borden explains to him the keyword is the trick that's the ex explanation the keyword and, is the method yeah. and the keyword is Tesla and so now Robert Angier takes this as I have to go see Tesla because this crazy scientist obviously did something made something for Angier to make his transport man a possibility exactly and also then this introduces us to Andy Serkis's character, it's always great to see him outside of the motion capture. And this is Ali. Uh, Ali. And this is early years for Andy Serkis. And he and Christian Bale actually starred in a, a few British films together. He was like supporting characters in that Hamlet production Christian Bale starred in. And I mean, he was films. Gollum, but like no yeah. one knew what he looked like. Yeah, exactly. And I think Chris Nolan, being such a great filmmaker and understanding the talent that certain actors have, like. He knows Andy Serkis is one of the ta most talented actors alive, so I'm going to cast him in my movie. Every character he plays, different person. Exactly. It's incredible.
But yeah, he's such a great guy. But then it's it's so interesting to again watch Nikola Tesla because the conversation that Tesla and Angier have when they're having lunch is really interesting because they're talking about obsession. And it's something that, is, that we talked about earlier with Angier and Alfred Borden, where their obsession leads to really nothing but death around them and misery, even though they achieve their great magical acts and acclaim from, from London. But Nikola Tesla, throughout this film and throughout the creation of this apparatus for Angier, warns him multiple times of the cost of such a, of, of, of such a tool or, or the cost of what it will cost you in terms of your, your humanity and it'll bring you nothing but pain and, and dread. Yeah, because it's you're you're this is not natural. This is not the at- natural order of things. What he's asking Tesla to do to to make a duplicate of him in order to pull off his own transported man like this is unnatural law and it shouldn't be. But Nikola Tesla desperate for money because he's lost his funding is willing to accept this job as a way to help fund his own research as well i also love that there's the the factor of edison and his men are kind of hovering around nikola tesla because just like borden and angier and their intense rivalry we get a glimpse or a hint at the rivalry between edison and nikola tesla which was immense and obviously it seems like edison ended up getting the upper hand and more power and maybe a larger impact on the world in terms of what he owned because Edison, that company, it secretly is like a huge company. Yeah, in, in the shadows. Yeah, like people don't realize like Edison's huge. It's not like his name just disappeared. For owns, some, that yeah. owns a lot of stuff. And Nikolai Tesla, he wanted to make electricity free. That was one of the reasons why he was destroyed and governments around the world were like, we can't, we have to charge for this. Like this can't be a free commodity. We have to produce it ourselves. Yeah, so it, he was completely destroyed by the industry because of that. But it's so cool because Nikola Tesla is referred to by Cutter and by, as a wizard, mm-hmm. he's like, oh, this was made by an actual wizard. And then even Ali, when he shows Angier the flashlights, Angier is like, this is real magic. I have found real magic, but he doesn't understand that. It's just oh, science. the light bulbs. Yeah, the light bulbs okay. in, the, in the field. What did mm-hmm. I say? Flash, flashlights. <laughs> I was, I was, you said that in my head. I was like, flash. What scene is he talking about? I was like, is there a scene with flashlights? Thanks for picking up on that. <laughs> I, I feel like in the back of my head, I was like, something didn't click right there. There's some code missing, bro. I think that's the shot that got the Oscar nomination. It was a beautiful shot. Yeah, I think that that shot right there with all the light bulbs in the in the field. And really, again, it's just science. And the perfect another great example is when. Um, Tesla, when he first meets Angier, he's holding a light bulb. He's like, hold out your hand. He grabs it, and they're both they're, – the energy in their bodies is creating the energy for the light to turn on. Yeah, and also at this point, we're still trying to figure out because it hasn't been expressed in, ter- in terms in, – in dialogue what exactly Tesla is building for Angier. And they do a couple of tests on the hats with the electricity and nothing happens. So we're still trying to figure out what exactly does Angier want from him. And at the same time as all these storylines going on, we're cutting backwards and forwards through time. We're also watching Alfred Borden rotting in prison, awaiting his execution. It's really fascinating because Angier has Alfred Borden's journal in diary, which he had Olivia steal from, which we eventually learn later on that Alfred Borden gave to Olivia to give to Angier. And also Angier gave Alfred Borden his diary under the guise of Lord Caldlow to read in prison while he's there alone. And so they're both reading each other's journal, journals and diaries, and we're also watching just like it, the first time you watch this movie is like, oh, Alfred Borden's a magician. He's obviously going to escape from prison somehow. It's just like, what's he going to do? And he pulls that trick on the guard by handcuffing his leg to the table and everything. So you think there's, there's no way he's going to be hung. Mm-hmm. He's going to get out of there somehow. But it gets to the point where it's like he, there's no way out of that prison, even for a magician. And he's tr- his, tr- his secrets to his tricks, the prestiges, are trying to be bought by the representative Lord Caldwell. So Lord Caldwell kind of is is blackmailing him in a way where he's going to offer that his daughter not be an orphan and that she'll be raised under his superstition so she'll want for nothing for the rest of her life she'll live a very privileged privileged life in exchange for his secrets and what's cool about the diaries is they both wanted the other person to get the diary because they both end the diaries with a message directly to the other whereas alfred says um reveals that olivia gave me the diary to give to you angier and, and then Angier, likewise, in his diary, tells Borden, then, there you are, rotting in prison for my murder. Which is crazy because he's supposed to be dead. And yeah. Alfred Borden can't believe it because I watched him die. He, he was on a, he was a, I watched you, you on a slab. You were on a slab. How is it you're still alive? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> she deserves. She needs to be with her father. <laughs> <laughs> Love Michael Caine. The mind games in this in this movie are incredible. And then once the machine is finished and and built, and Gia well, there's well, there's some first. There's some tests that go wrong yeah. that they think go wrong, which is really interesting because we still fully don't know what the machine does. But if you're paying attention and remember back to the first shot of the film, the first thing that they electrocute, you could say, or put all the put inside of the machine is the top hat, and they they try to try to test that multiple times, but they don't know what it does and they, they try to do the cat later on but continue with but then the, we were it's a great reveal of how the machine works with the cat when the cat ends up getting in a fight in a, a tussle with another cat outside and, and gia follows the the sound and he discovers that the cat is fighting what looks like an identical cat to itself and he discovers there's got to be 50 top hats on the ground in that same spot and this makes them all realize they are cloning these hats and they did clone this cat it just happened to be the clone showed up where they didn't expect it to. So clone is a word I think doesn't work with this. I think clone is the wrong word to use. Sorry, it's it, exact copies. Yeah. So duplicate. Co because yeah, duplicate as well. But I think just an exact copy of what it was. Whereas a clone is like you create and, another being. Yeah. Naturally, you can, a, a physical not, form. Yeah. But this is a literally exact copy of what that entity is. Yeah. So what? Ha so and we'll get to Angier where he ends up using this, this machine for the transported man. The what is it called? He calls it the real transported man. New, well, it goes. It's the new transported man, and then what's the final one? Does he call it? I thought he calls it the real transported man. Or right, the I, think, new, yeah. I think it is the yeah real the real transported. Yeah, I think you're right. Which is ironic because it is really. And w what tr Angier is doing is he's the machine creates a duplicate. Like you said, it's not a clone. It's a literal duplicate of him. And so when the machine runs and another Angier appears, it is the same Angier. They're both the same thing. That Angier that just appeared has the same soul and mind and thoughts as the other Angier. Up to the second that he yeah. was copied. Exactly. And then once they, they appear, then they're having their own unique experience opposed, as opposed to the other Angier from that moment. But it's not like it's a, a physical copy of Angier that has no soul or mind or anything. It really It's literally two of the same thing. Yeah, so it's that's something that really I think is a... A misconception about this movie it's not clones again it's an exact copy that's why they have up to that point the exact same experiences so like you said perfect way you put it exact same being mm -hmm. it's just un 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 unscientific and or this, whatever. Is, this is what allows them to create the perfect version of the trick because when Borden sees the trick in person and he looks up on the balcony when uh, Angier appears the duplicate Angier he doesn't know yet. He sees that this really is the exact Angier because all the other transporter mans, Borden was able to spot the problem immediately. Like the first Angier, he was able to see like, yeah, he, he somehow he shows up and he's drunk and overweight and like, how does he do it? It's yeah. a mystery. <laughs> but does this, he enjoy taking his bowels below the stage? Yeah, so he's, no, it's killing him. It's eating him alive. He shares no relish. He relishes in none of our success. Exactly. Whereas in this moment, when he sees Angier on the balcony, he's like. He can tell that really is Angier because it is him. Yeah, so he knows because he knows that he uses a duplicate as well. That yeah. that's not a duplicate. That is clearly Angier. He's not doing what I'm doing. And then after that, he he discover he realizes that there's no way of ever understanding how Angier did it. He he eventually does later on at the end of the film. But so while Angier is setting up this new trick with Cutter, he wants Cutter for a house only. He doesn't want Cutter to understand what he's gone what depths he's gone to and what he's doing every single night by by we'll, we'll talk about that in a sec but that's why he has a blind crew yeah so he has a blind stage hands on purpose because he doesn't want anyone to see what's really happening below the stage but at the time he's getting the show set up he's going to have a limited engagement 100 shows only and then he's done these are the tickets this is the cost it's going to make me a fortune and then i'm gone forever alfred borden's the professor is killing he's the biggest show in london he's got He's got X every night selling them out totally, but he's, he's also his relationship with Sarah is crumbling to the point where she they there's that fight they have at the restaurant where while Alfred Borden's uh, blindly Strong drunk character and we, they're also with Fallon and Olivia and Olivia and Fallon takes Olivia home. But this eventually leads to Sarah's suicide because she can't take the secrets anymore. She can't take the constant performing, the constant lies, and she just ends up killing herself. It's so tragic. Mm -hmm. it's, it's tough for her, yeah. It's a tough life. She went through a lot. Yeah. I think that we should get into our intermission. Oh, and then, yeah. And then once we're done with the intermission, we can get into spoiler territory. Yeah, for sure. But actually, our intermission is brought to you by MoviePosters.com, so tell us about that. Now to our intermission. I, I didn't realize we were like 45 yeah, minutes we're cruising. in. We're having so much fun. We love this movie. So let's begin with our movie quote competition. Like usual, I have two, one for me and one from a fan. This one is from Joshua Mackey. 
Yeah, well, you know, that's just like your opinion, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, what's this from? Oh man. Yeah, well, you know, that's, that's just, just like, like your, your opinion, opinion man. man. Oh, I can't think of it. It's some kind of stoner. Yeah, I don't know it. It's Big Lebowski. Oh yeah, shoot <laughs> at the bowling alley. Yeah, yeah. Hey Zeus, Jesus, I am Jesus. <laughs> when he licks it. <laughs> All right, and this one is for me. I used to produce. I, I'll do it in the in the voice. I used to produce movies in the. No, nah, I can't do it. Never mind. I used to produce movies in the eighties, kind of like action films, sexy stuff. One critic called them European. I thought they were shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Oh my God. Hold on. Can you say it again? I used to produce movies in the 80s, kind of like action films, sexy stuff. One critic called them European. I thought they were shit. I can't. I can't. Drive. Oh, my God. Bernie. Yeah, Bernie. Albert Brooks character. Yeah. Oh, man. That's a great That's quote. a good obscure one. Yeah. All right, here's mine. It's two characters talking. You'll, you'll understand it once, once, you, once you hear what Hopefully. it is. So uh, character one says, hey, it's me. Character two says, prove it. Character one says, you're a dick. Character two says, okay. Oh. <laughs> oh, what is this? Oh, I know this. <laughs> <laughs> Why am I thinking Simon Pegg? <laughs> Say it again. Hey, it's me. Prove it. You're a dick. Okay. <laughs> oh, my God. I, I'm drawing such a blank on this. Is it Shaun of the Dead? No. No, no it's not Simon Pegg. No. I don't know why I'm thinking. What is it? X-Men. Oh, it's Hugh Wolver Jackman, yeah. Wolverine. Yeah. Cyclops. Cyclops. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That is a great one. That's a great, great, great one. All right. Guess this movie release year. Van Helsing. Okay. Hold on. 2006. 2004. Oh, man. Wow. That's older than I thought it was. Yeah. Wow. A couple years before this. Yeah. Yeah, Mine. so I think we just disproved the fact that uh, Hugh Jackman wasn't in big any movies. Yeah, I guess the yeah, fountain I guess and Van so. It's okay. Yeah. You just don't remember. Yeah, I should. You, I should just quit. <laughs> <laughs> who who wants to be, take at these places? <laughs> Co-host of Raiders of the Lost Podcast. We're taking auditions. I'm done. Send the tape to our Instagram See DMs ya. of you uh, talking about movies. I'll give you my tablet. I'll, and I'll choose a winner by yeah. the end of the month. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can finish out the week, <laughs> <laughs> but clear your shit soon. <laughs> You're fired. <laughs> Actually, can you keep editing? It's <laughs> <laughs> not going to pay me. <laughs> okay, my movie release year is the original The Italian Job. Starring Michael, Michael Kine. Kine. This movie is so ridiculous. He sleeps with like five women in the first 30 minutes of this movie. It's it's ridiculous what they got away with in the 60s. He's a player. Michael Caine probably did do that. It, it, the first act of that movie, it's just like he gets, he's in a room with like five women, like, all right, let's go. It's like, Jesus. It's like Austin Powers. And then two scenes later, he's sleeping with another woman. It's <laughs> wild. It's it's crazy, dude. Um, I would say 1972. 69. Was it 69? Yeah. Uh, I was like, is it the 60s? But yeah, thinking about the film quality, uh, yeah. 1960s. All right. Now we're on to movie pop quiz time. Let's go. Christopher Nolan's brother, Jonathan Nolan, has written or co-written four of Christopher Nolan's film's screenplays. What are the four scripts? Written or co-written? Yeah. Okay. So, obviously, Prestige. One. <laughs> Dark Knight. Two. Interstellar. Three. One more. Does adapted count? Adapted? What do you mean? Because Memento Mori, he didn't write Memento, but it was adapted. Well, I mean, from go back Memento. to the question. I said screenplay. Okay, so written or co-written? Hmm. It's got to be. What am? Ugh. Did he co? Dark Knight Rises? Yeah. Oh, okay. Nice. I didn't think he did. Yeah. Oh, okay. I shouldn't have given you that because it was a question. <laughs> but I'll give it to you. But actually, I thought I thought I could trick you with Memento. He wrote the short story, so, yeah. but he didn't write the script. So yeah, didn't trick me. Yeah, I almost got you. No, you didn't. That was good you didn't though. Even come close to getting me. Well, I, you know what? I shouldn't have even said that. Dark I got the job back. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting right. that right. What's your uh, pop quiz? In what movie did Hugh Jackman play a pirate? A pirate. Hmm. He's not in any of the Peter Pan movies, is he? 
He is, isn't he? He is in <laughs> which Peter Pan movie is it? Gotta get it right. Oh <laughs> crap. <laughs> um uh, not the Robin Williams one. No, the he was oh, he's too young. Hook. Yeah. No, oh. no, that's no, that's the Robin Williams one. Oh, um Tustin Hoffman played Hook and Hook. Peter Pan. <laughs> the Lost Boys. The the what are they called? The <laughs> <laughs> That's what they're called, yeah. I don't know. Pan. Pan. Oh, god damn it. It's just one You're word. pretty much right. Yeah. Could have given he it played, to me. He could have given it to me. I gave you Dark Knight Rises. I got it. <laughs> no, you you answered it, the Dark Knight Rises, is it? Yeah. No, it was a it was an it was an answer than the phrasing of a question. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't what is. What is the Dark Knight Rises? <laughs> he played Blackbeard in Pan. Yeah, you're right. Cool. I, I almost got it. Um, biggest hater of the week. So we posted a video of just explaining Hereditary, which we just did an episode on with Midsommar. We made a clip, 60 seconds, Hereditary explained in 60 seconds. It's a great ending. clip. For, a lot of people are still confused by that movie, and you can tell by the comments in that was a banger of a video. <laughs> <laughs> but a bunch of people, one specifically, like went off the chain. I'm not going to say their username, but they wrote like, how did you not get get this? Did you even watch the movie? Like, how how do you guys not understand this? Now, I want to just be like, I didn't respond, but we're a film podcast. We talk about movies. We analyze plots. That's what we do. What the hell else do you want us to talk about besides film stuff? I also think that people like that are bullshitting I when they so say too. like, how did you not get this? I feel like they're just trying to act smart and powerful. Like, oh, I understood this. Whereas, like, clearly a lot of people. Uh, really enjoyed our ex- explanation of it and found it helpful to the for, to them understanding the movie. It's a complicated ending. Yeah, it's a very complex movie, and it took me a few watches to understand it fully. And so I think that they're completely full of shit. Honestly, I agree. Yeah. All right. Do you have a hater? Oh yeah, I got a hater. Let me let me pull up this hater. I think they might unsubscribe. Hold huh? well, I'm gonna do water real quick. Good one. I posted a clip on uh, what's the movie? Gunpowder Milkshake mm-hmm. about the three fairies and how each of the the three aunts in the movie they have the same colors as the three fairies from Sleeping Beauty. And Damon Lamont ten sixteen wrote, "I'm colorblind. I'm triggered. Unsubscribed." <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. I cracked up. It was funny. <laughs> <laughs> Our biggest supporter of the week is a five star review from This App Stinks One Two Three. <laughs> Best podcast running. Absolutely love the podcast. However, would really love if you guys could watch and review the Escape Room movies. Maybe we will someday. Yeah, we're gonna watch They're them, really yeah. twisted. We'd love for you guys to piece them together. But thank you so much for the five star review and the kind words. Really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. And on this day in film history, today is August twelfth in nineteen twenty seven. Wing Wings. One of only two silent films to be nominated for Best Picture. The other is The Artist in 2011, Open, starring Clara Bow. And also for films that were released, we have Sausage Party in 2016, which is a very funny movie. Uh, Four Brothers, released in 2005. 30 Minutes or Less, released in 2011. And nothing really else great besides that. Hmm. Streaming recommendations, I have Hotel Rwanda on Amazon Prime. This tells the story of the Hutu genocide of the Tutsis in Rwanda, Africa, which happened over the course of just 100 days in 1994 is a horrific, tragic story. 800,000 people were killed in Rwanda by the Hutu extremists, and it stars Don Cheadle. Very, very powerful film. It's it's really emotional, but it's very historic, and I think it's an important movie to watch to understand the history of what happened. Yeah, great wreck. My recommendation is Only Lovers Left Alive on Amazon Prime. Good choice. Which is a fantastic a vampire movie stars Tilda Swinton and, and Tom Hiddleston as vampire lovers who have been uh, living throughout the past centuries, trying to like understand their place in the world and adapt to the ch- changing times. And it's a very dark comedy. It's it has a great style and tone to it. And just watching them on screen together is great. All right, let's get back into the Prestige. Are you watching Watch closely? closely? And so what, what would we leave off on? So we were talking about Angier and his trick and, and how he was and getting Borden, it going. And, and Borden couldn't understand how he did it. And so Angier and went Sarah, to great yeah. depths to try to copy and make better Alfred Borden's trick, the transport of man, which he eventually does when he makes the copies of himself to create the transport of man. You could say he perfects it. He perfects it, yeah. He makes a much better performance and act. Because what he never understood 
even though Cutter told him right to his face, even though Olivia tells him that I've been backstage, I haven't seen the double, but he's using a double. It's the only way he can do it. He never understood that it was a simple trick. It was something simple as identical twins. Mm. So Alfred Borden is an identical twin. He has been his entire life, obviously. But he and his brother, Freddie, so there's Alfred and Freddie, they have been living this entire life basically of a magical act to protect their secret to create the transported man so and in the book they their names are albert and frederick mm -hmm. but we're just gonna we're gonna call them freddie and albert as because olivia calls the other twin freddie well, as a way of they also call him alfred yeah they never call him albert in the movie yeah so it's alfred, exactly yeah. alfred and freddie and so this explains so much especially the dual personalities that not only Angier's reading about in his book, when he's talking about one minute he says this, the next minute he's talking about that. How can you not remember what Naughty tied? And same thing with Olivia. Freddie loves Olivia, whereas Alfred loves Sarah. But this also ties to all the times where Sarah's like, today you love me, and I, I can see that, or today you don't love me, because whenever she's with the Borden that doesn't love her, that's Freddie. But when she's with the Borden that does love her, that's her true husband, Alfred. And... Fallon is always played by the twin that isn't pre pretending to be Alfred that day. So they take turns playing Alfred and Fallon. So while Freddy is Fallon, a Albert is Alfred. And while Alf Alfred is Alfred. And then and then when um, Alfred is Fallon, then Freddy is Albert. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's really unfortunate because at the end of the film, this is when... You know, Alfred's confessing to Angier his secret, how simple it was. And he's explaining to them... Alfred and Freddy, they lived two halves of a life, and that was enough for them. But it wasn't enough for Sarah, it wasn't enough for Olivia, and it probably wasn't enough for Jess either. And Jess is Alfred's daughter, not Freddy's daughter. I don't. I would say that it's possible that Freddy never was sexually intimate with Sarah. Oh, 100% wasn't. And then, likewise, Alfred was never sexually intimate with Olivia. I 100% agree. Yeah. That's why when Olivia goes to kiss Alfred that one time, he turns away because... It's 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 Alfred, not Freddie, and yeah. you can tell that he's done this multiple times. And she says that thing like, "What do I tell you? When you're here with me, you're with me. When you're with me, you're with me. Leave your family at home, kid." That's Is she a... from Brooklyn now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. There's the city accent just came out of me. From Long Island. <laughs> uh, that's not more Boston. Come on, kid. I'm going home soon, kid. But, but the thing with the twins is, they are in love with magic, and they understood that in order to create this trick, that would have been. The, the masterpiece of their career they would have had to commit to the trick completely and dedicate their lives to it and by doing, just like Chen Cheng Su Li yeah exactly and they understood that in order for the trick to work would be to use them as twins and actually this was a trick that um, magicians used at, twins used a lot actually at this time the duplicate having a double as a twin was actually used a lot and I just repeated myself <laughs> You're fired, man. You're you're losing your job again. <laughs> I'm done. Who who wants the I'm opening? Finished. You'll find it on Craigslist tomorrow. Need new podcast host. Less but, funny though. But for them, <laughs> their their love of <laughs> their love of magic is so intense that they're willing to sacrifice having a full life of their own in order to implement carrying out the trick. And so obviously, you and I, we, sharing a life would not be adequate. Dude, sharing for me. a bedroom till fifteen was yeah, enough. No way. But for them. Their dedication to the craft, like they're willing to just live half a life. They're willing to just live half of their days as Alfred and half of their days as Fallon, and then the other half of their days as Freddie. And honestly, have, it's yeah. probably a nice break. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> gotta get away from my kid tonight. Except for like you know destroying your marriage. Yeah, that's I know, it's, a, it's a joke <laughs> and causing the suicide of Sarah. It's but terrible. Be, and, but that's what he always tells Angie about not understanding the the sacrifice and dedication it takes to to make a great trick like that work, they, where they have dedicated their lives for. I mean, who knows? Maybe five or six years before they even met Sarah. Yeah, so I won't talk about it too much, but in the book, it talks about how they went and forged records to make it seem to to make the past of them being twins okay. invisible. Got it. So it's probably something they've been working on for at least half a decade, like you said. And in terms of sacrifice, not only are they sacrificing their lives with their with their significant others and families. When Alfred gets his hands shut off, which you can probably argue is probably Freddie, because in my opinion, Freddie's the more reckless one. He's, yeah, let's talk about personality real quick. He, Freddie's a lot more ambitious. He's he seems to be more playful personality. Um, he's very uh, Freddie's impulsive. He is short tempered. 
a little bit more selfish and a little bit more arrogant than Alfred is. And Alfred's more reserved. He's more. He's probably more of the thinker in terms of the acts. That's why when Alfred's yelling at him, like after they see Angier's perfect act, he's like, "How come you can't outthink that's, him?" That's Freddie yelling at Alfred, yeah. dressed as as dressed as Borden. I mean, uh, Fallon. And and Alfred seems to be just like more modest, more kind-hearted. Mm-hmm. Not to say that Freddie is bad, but he just has. Uh, worst personality traits, not to the extreme, but just the characteristics that contrasted with Alfred. And I think a great shot to show this is the first time when he's talking to Olivia in her interview, really, of her confessing to him what Angier told her to say. He has that very, like, loving look, like, I'm very attracted to you, and they both have that look for each other. Yeah, they're flirting. Whereas uh, Alfred really never has that for Sarah because, again, he's a very modest and humble person, so he's obviously attracted to his wife, but it's different. Exactly. Like, when he drops her off at her house, at her apartment after they get lunch, he... he Quiet, he kind of like asks like if you, can I are you gonna invite me? Keeps in for his tea? distance, but he's also very reserved and like yeah, very respectful of her space despite breaking inside her room. <laughs> yeah, well, well, Freddie breaks inside of her room. Oh yeah, that's, that's what right. happens. Yeah. So she enters her apartment and then Freddie's already inside with the teapot ready. And you can just tell from the way Freddie's laughing, he seems to be more rambunctious as well. Yeah, you're right. It's actually a great point, and the yeah. laugh is different than Alfred's for sure. Exactly. And another point of sacrifice is when they're doing the bullet trick, which we were, I was talking about a second ago, which is probably Freddy as the professor because this is the trick that he really wants to do, you can tell, because he's that crazy, ambitious one. Um, and Angier shoots off two of his fingers. In order to keep the trick alive for the transported man, the other one's going to have to have two of his fingers removed. And so it's a really horrific scene where, thank God they don't show it, yeah. but he has to cut off his fingers with the, the hammer. Nolan always does a great job with off-screen violence and gore. He, he like the j- Joker slicing people up, you never see it, but you can you feel it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And another great instance, a hint of it, is when Sarah tells Alfred that she's pregnant, and he goes, oh, we got to tell Fallon. Yeah. It's actually Freddy saying, I need to tell Alfred because it's his son. Yeah. It's obviously not my son, so he needs to know this right away. Yeah. And he also seems like kind of excited, but like his excited is like it's an, an uncle. uncle yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's different than an actual father. And the thing with, what was I just about to say? Okay, so, and this is a very clear distinction that we're trying to make where the personalities are different between Alfred and Freddy, which is proves to people another common myth that Alfred and Freddy are not copies. They're not duplicates. They didn't get a machine from Tesla. They're identical twins. They're different personalities. The different women they love, those are proof that they're not copies. They were never copied in the past, whereas Angier is an exact copy of every Angier in the future. And what, and what confuses people is the diary keyword. And so when when Alfred gives the keyword to Angier for his diary so that he can translate it, he tells him the keyword is Tesla, and Tesla is the method. And so what he's doing is he's leading Angier on a false trail. Yes, the keyword was Tesla, but Tesla was not the method to the transporter man for Alfred. Alfred's method, like we said, was identical twins. But he knows that if he says Tesla was the method, Angier will go to Colorado and spend a fortune trying to figure out a way of creating his own version of the trick and probably waste away in Colorado. Misdirection. Yeah. It's throughout the entire film. This is a perfect case it's of a this, trick. This is a trick. Yeah. It's all misdirection, but obviously we learn that Angier and Tesla create an apparatus to copy himself. And so, but it's also to reiterate the fact that they're identical twins. It, there's a literal line in the film where it says, Tesla never made a machine for anybody. And that's what Angier says to Ali. He's like, Tesla made a machine for Ali. And Ali's like, I never said that. Yeah. You said that. We never said that. So Tesla and Ali were even taking, advan- were taking advantage of Angier because, exactly. because they lost their funding from the government. And so they needed a, a new influx of cash. And so Angier showing up was the perfect thing for them where they kind of, they pretended to make it seem like, oh yeah, we did. Kind of, we we know what you're talking about in terms of a we machine. could probably we could probably we can do whip something it up for you, but he, they never <laughs> did. They needed his money, and they knew that Angie pumping them with money would be, would save their their endeavor. Unfortunately, Tesla is a genius that he figured out how to make copies of something. Yeah, and so that's Alfred's trick again. Identical twins. You can believe us if you're not. That is a hundred percent a fact of this story. And there's another clue. Uh, Jess, when she first go, when he first meets Jess and Sarah. Um, and uh, and Alfred shows her the bird in the cage saying, like, hey, it's okay, he's still oh, no, alive. It's not, it's not Jess, it's, it's her nephew. I'm sorry, the nephew, I'm sorry, the nephew. And he's like, the bird's okay, don't worry. And then he goes, but what about his brother? And so that's a hint that 
and Alfred is a brother. Exactly. Yeah. I'm so glad you brought up the bird trick because I'm going to relate the metaphor of the bird trick that Cutter does in the opening of the film to the secret behind Angier's film. So, I'm so excited. So we got... <laughs> well, <laughs> why is this? So another very big misconception of this film is whether or not Angier is the person that goes below the stage or that is at the end is the prestige. And so... Because he says the line, it's, it took courage to to not know whether I'd be the person in the box or the person at the, on the stage. So this is how Angier's trick works. His apparatus, it creates a exact copy of himself. Again, every memory, every experience up to that second of the copy and duplication, it's Angier. And so it, the copy of Angier from the machine has been projected to a certain location off stage in the balcony. So they he actually is able to coordinate where that's gonna go. Same thing with the hats and same thing with the cat. They just have to calibrate to what direction and how far away they want it. And so every night, Angier goes inside the apparatus, kills himself while he gets copied by the machine when all the lightning's going around him. He falls under stage, dies, kills himself, drowns. and drowns. And the copy is the one on the balcony. And then the next night, that copy that was at the end of the trick, the copy that was the prestige of the trick from the night before, he goes on stage the next night, he kills himself and creates a copy. And that copy is now the new... Angier on the back balcony. So it's a never ending cycle of only copies. So Angier, the original Angier, died the first time he performed the new the, the real transported man on stage. The first night he drowned, that was the original Angier. From then on, it's just copy after copy. And so technically, Angier is both the man in the box and the man on the stage. And that's why it's it's a great line because I think it makes people think so much. Is like it took courage not knowing if I was going to die or be on, on the stage. It's because every copy thinks they're Angier. Of yeah. course, you're going to go on that stage and be like, I hope I'm not the one that's going to be in the box and drown to death because why would I do that to myself when really that's what I'm doing? Because technically, he doesn't he doesn't know for sure how it works. He doesn't know am I being transported there great and then point. a copy and then a copy is replacing me on stage. Or I'm being put under the stage to drown, and a co and the copy is putting out there. Exactly. So he doesn't know for sure himself how it works because both are Angier completely, wholeheartedly, soul, mind, and body. Yes, but again, it's a never-ending cycle. He dies, kills himself, creates a copy, which is in the balcony. And that balcony copy does the same thing over and over again. And so I think we just said it three times. Yeah. If you haven't grasped it yet, rewind about five minutes. And that's why even though the copy takes over every night, he know he is is the same person, so that's why he he stashes the old the old body and puts it into the other uh, arena that's hidden, and he has the st stage hand. So he carries out the endeavor over and over again because he is Angier. And again, another example of proof that this is true and that we're right is the bird <laughs> trick. We are right. This is the bird trick with Cutter in the opening of the film. What is the bird trick? There's the bird in the cage. Cutter puts the blanket on top of the cage, smashes the cage down, and it disappears inside the table. And that bird in the table is dead. And so what's he do? He pulls out a different bird that looks exactly the same out of his pocket and brings the bird back to life. So the bird dies, and a new one is brought out. Same thing with Angier's trick. Angier dies, his copy is brought out. It's exactly. And the only difference is those birds are not copies of yeah. each other but they look identical whereas Angier is literally copying himself but that is the perfect translation for what Angier is doing it's so obvious yeah. I tell, I tell, I'm telling you every time you watch a Nolan movie the first three minutes he's telling you the rules exactly and one of my favorite shots is he. there's another sh another way in which Nolan and cinematographer Wally Pfister relay the parallel between the birds and Angier and his copies is so the ending shot is um Alfred arrives at the theater at the theater basement and finds Angier, shoots him, and then he tells Angier how he did his trick that he's an identical twin and that his twin Freddy just is dead, but he's he's still alive. And and then he sees yeah, so Freddy's the one in prison. Yeah, Freddy's Freddy's the one who hangs, and Alfred's the one who survives, rightfully so because his his daughter Jess is the one who needs the real father. He deserves to be with her. And then also Freddy, it's his own fault, his own ambition and arrogance and greed, which is what got him caught in the first place by trying to, to see how Angier was performing his trick and going back. Even though Alfred told him to leave it alone. Yeah, Alfred's the one who told him, like, leave it alone, leave him to his trick. Forget it. Forget it. We're done. We're done. But Freddy couldn't help himself. So Freddy's the one who's in prison. And at the end, Alfred sees all these water tanks with the copies of Angier. And then he tells him, like, you spent a fortune, you did really terrible things. You did terrible things. Terrible things. And then the, the, 
the fire begins in out and Borden uh, Angier dies and the fire starts and then Borden leaves and then the last shot we see is uh, the camera uh, it pans to the left and it goes to a close-up of one of the tanks and we see the exact copy of Angier dead in the water and there are the tanks behind it right so there's like a dozen tanks behind it and Chris Nolan did the exact same shot in the bird cages where he shot the there's a whole wall of cages of birds and he does the same side shot from one bird cage at the front and you can see the other birds in the distance in the foreground lined up behind it. Great point. Exact same shot showing that there are a bunch of copies of these birds just like how there are a bunch of copies of Angier. Yeah, and so fortunately Cutter kind of basically understands what's happening and he, because he meets Lord Caldwell. So after Tesla is basically run out of town by the American government and Edison's men, they burn down his factory. Angier is given the box by the hotel managers. I didn't think it was necessary to tell Edison's people about the box. <laughs> What's in the box? What's in the box? What's in the box? <laughs> he says box, right? Yeah. And so... No, he says, What's in the box? <laughs> <laughs> I just lost my train of thought. What was I saying? Angier in the box. No, before that. Cutter. Okay, so Cutter... <laughs> <laughs> it's like one sentence. I lost my... What was I saying? You were talking about how uh, he didn't know that... Tesla left him in the box. Okay. I still think I lost what I was talking about. <laughs> it just know. escaped me, man. I don't know what you were going to say. Oh, it was probably going to be not that interesting. You messed yourself up by doing the what? What's in the box? What's in the box? In I, the couldn't, box? I couldn't help myself, man. I never can with a box <laughs> joke. We reference it like every other episode. Every other day, too. <laughs> Hold on. Like, give me a second. It might come to me. Either way, so Cutter learns basically what's happening in a way... And, he, okay, so Lord Caldwell is the one who purchases all the boxes and apparatus that Angier left behind in Edison is, and, and Tesla as well. And that's where Cutter is able to accidentally, on purpose, meet Caldwell, Caldwell, and learns that it's Angier. And he sees him for the first time. He's like, I saw you dead. You were on a slab. <laughs> and because of this, Cutter has a change of heart where... Angier's clearly done something terrible. He has no idea what he's done yet, but it's impossible for him to be alive when he saw him dead. And not only that, is he, he has Alfred's son, I mean daughter, Jess, and he's, she's taking care of him, and, he, and she deserves to be with her real father. And so because I think Cutter's so clever, he under, he knew that they had to be identical twins. He, he knew he had to be using a double, and that's where he works with Alfred to get Jess to Alfred and then also give Alfred access to the basement under the stage. Yeah, because what Angier did was horrible, a ho truly villainous act to, to take a father from his daughter and to let him hang for a crime he didn't commit. And I think Cutter definitely felt a lot of guilt because he played a major major part in the actual trial by helping to convict Alfred. He also, I think he should have some guilt on his conscience as well because of when Julia died and he tried to comfort Angier by telling him that he knew a sailor once who drowned but came back to life five minutes later. And he said that drowning was like going to sleep. Going right? home. It was like going home. Have you even seen the movie? <laughs> it was peaceful. <laughs> so going to sleep? Someone's got like... <laughs> I, was, I think I was quoting Sirius Black. <laughs> Faster than falling asleep. <laughs> We're right here. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and so that comforts Angier. And I think that is what lets Angier, gives him courage to do something horrible in terms of drowning himself every night, thinking that... If I'm going to have to kill myself, I might as well do something where, like Cutter says, it's like going home. But then the last thing that Cutter says to Angier is he says that, I did lie to you. I said that it's like going home. But he, I, what really happens is when you drown, it's agony. It's agony. So, and, and then there's that look on Angier's face and he kind of like clears the dust away from one of the tanks. He's like, what have I done? But also in his heart, I don't think he really cares that much. The thing with Angier's situation is he didn't have to kill the first copy. They could have lived as Angier and performed the trick perfectly. That's a great point. But I think what, it, and it would have worked the same. He didn't have to keep killing copies of himself and keep killing himself and creating copies. Like, it could have just been two Angiers. It would have been perfect and fine. But the thing with Angier is what makes him so different from Alfred and Freddy is he's unwilling to share the glory. He's unwilling to share it. Whereas Alfred and Freddy, half of life is good enough. We can share the trick. We're, we're, chival we're modest enough. We're just... Doing the trick is enough for us, and we can share the load and share the glory. 
and the attention, whereas Angier, he wanted the wealth, he wanted the power. He, he wants the, to be the prestige yeah, he wants every to, night. He wants to be in front of the crowd, so that's why he set it up to kill the copy every time. And also, I think the first time he kills the first copy is he doesn't understand what's going to happen. I'm sure yeah. he's terrified. He's like, I got to kill this dude. He looks just like me. Yeah, exactly. But then the next one, he could have been like talking to him just like see what's going on. Bro, like, what am I thinking right now? <laughs> <laughs> but instead he's like murdered, straight murking himself over and over again. Yeah. But that's the major personality difference between Angier and the twins. Wow, it's such a good movie. Yeah, it's great, man. It's a great ending too. Phenomenal ending. Oh man, I think I think we're done. We, we we went to town explaining wow, that. Yeah, man, that's such a good movie. It's so yeah. fun. Um, how about do we, some trivia? Trivia? Yeah, let's do some trivia. Sweet. So Chung Ling Su was actually a stage character created by William Ellsworth Robinson, a white man who disguised himself as a Chinese man to cash in on audiences' enthusiasm for the exotic. Robinson lived as Chung, never breaking character while in public. He died in March 1918 when a bullet catch trick went wrong. My God, I've been shot, were the, both the, his last and first English words spoken on stage in 19 years. <laughs> the irony. Crazy. The word prestige originally meant a trick from the Latin prestigium meaning illusion nikola tesla was a world-renowned inventor physicist and engineer and for a while he did conduct extreme electrical experiments at his lab in colorado springs where he was also known for his eccentric behavior the main characters alfred alfred borden and robert angier spell the word abra as an abracadabra a common word used by magicians the prestige includes 164 Hold on, let me say this again. The editing in The Prestige includes 146 time jump cuts in which the next shot either flashes back or skips ahead to another period in time of the storyline. This averages to almost one timeline jump per minute of the movie, so you really have to pay attention. There is a hint in this movie, and it is confirmed in the novel that the twins are named Albert and Frederick Borden. Hence, they combine their names Al and Fred to create Alfred Borden. Sam Mendes actually wanted to do this movie as a follow-up to American Beauty, which had just been nominated for seven Academy Awards. The uh, When another offer came from New Market Films on behalf of writer, producer, and director Christopher Nolan, of whom author Christopher Priest had never heard of, Priest was prepared to close the deal with Mendes when a VHS copy of Nolan's film Following, which was released in 1998, was delivered to his house by motorcycle. Priest was impressed and chose Nolan to do the film. He also wanted to help a up-and-coming filmmaker rather than an established one. Plus, following is a, a tremendous debut for such a low budget, like ten thousand dollars. Yeah, it's great. That's it for my trivia. You got any more? Nah, I think that's it. Want to do some superlatives? Let's do it. Who is your MVP? Uh, I got Hugh Jackman. I think he's just really great in this. I movie. did too. Yeah, he's, he's just a, sensational. Obviously, everyone else is really good, but I think this is like you said, Hugh Jackman's probably best performance. Mm -hmm. Best scene. I want to say the um, just the confession at the end where we finally learn all of Borden's truths about him being an identical twin and also the, basically watching Angier, you could say, get what he deserves in the end. So did I, the ending. Yeah. What's the best shot? I actually couldn't pick one. There's so many to choose from. But if I have to on the spot, on the top of my head, pick one, I think I would pick something after you tell me yours. <laughs> <laughs> Someone didn't get repair. I picked the final shot of the reveal of the copy of Angier. Yeah, so is it the camera, it zooms, it pulls out and then goes left, right? Or is it no, a pan, just, is it just, a pan left? Yeah, it just goes. Is it a pan left? It or, is it, or is it a, a track, track left? Track left, yeah. gotcha. Yeah, it's, it's a really, I never even picked up on the birdcage thing that you brought up earlier. I was like, wow, I know exactly. When you were talking about it, I'm like, I never picked up on that. Yeah, I know. I, I know a few things. Wicked smart, kid. <laughs> I read it in a book. <laughs> in a book. <laughs> um, all right, favorite shot, probably. Let's go, man. I think the when, people are waiting. <laughs> when Tesla walks through the electricity. That's a cool shot. It's pretty badass. That's a pretty cool shot. It's a great cool. interest. It seems like something David Bowie would do on stage. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> What's the best line? Are you watching closely? Nice. Mine was, it was the look on their faces. <laughs> That's it. Wow. That was a lot of fun. I love doing Nolan movies. Yeah. The Prestige. It's a fantastic movie. Hope you all enjoyed this film. And, and if you were a little confused about the movie, we hope you helped 
We helped you understand it better. And if trust us, we're yeah. right. Yeah, we're right. We're correct. <laughs> and if you already knew it, we hope you enjoyed the review. Yeah, and uh, make sure to go to patreoncom slash of Lost Podcast to help support the show. Two dollar, five dollar, ten dollar tiers. That's all it costs, and you get access to all exclusive features, including bonus episodes every single Tuesday. It goes a long way to helping us out. Thanks so much for tuning in, everybody around the world. Take care. Bye. Why are you watching closely? Are you Thanks so much for tuning in to Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Be sure to subscribe if you're new. Hit the like button. Leave a comment. Find us on all audio streaming platforms, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. Wherever you listen to podcasts, you can find us. Find us on Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Be sure to check out one of these other videos right here for more content on our favorite films and breaking down all kinds of movie content. Thanks so much.